in the house of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. My, my, you are a good looking bunch of people, I tell you what. Good, so good to see you. Turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, you're a good looking Christian, you know that? Praise the Lord. Amen. It's great to be in the best church in town. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Welcome, everybody, to Apostolic Christian Fellowship. Great big Christian family. Growing every day. Amen. Let's just get a few announcements out of the way so we can get back to doing what we came to do. That's worship the Lord. I feel a wonderful liberty to worship the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Let's tune into that tonight and push on and press on. I feel victory in the air tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, Just no telling what the Lord is going to do here tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, we're going to set you free to do what you want to do, Lord. I just want to remind everybody, how many of you remember uh, the, uh, the group that came here, the former owners of this building with the Haiti mission? All right, there, you know, February is right around the corner. They're getting red things ready. Uh, to pack up and take down there for their trip. And so I think the deadline for bringing things in, uh, there's a list of things that they're in need of, uh, kind of pinned to the bulletin board. Both bulletin, bulletin boards have a list. All right. There are some items, over-the-counter kind of medications. They really don't have this quite the same setup that we do there, so I, I'm not sure they would be able to, to use a lot of those things. Um, and I don't know if they can actually transport them out of state without a medical license. So there is a list of things that they can take there. Uh, so if that's on your heart, and I think the deadline is going to be February 9th. I want to announce uh, we're going to have our annual business meeting here February 7th. That's a Wednesday. Normally our service, our, our midweek Bible study starts at 7 it's not going to take long. Uh, it's just kind of a formality we have to go through. IRS requires these things. We are a 501c3 corporation. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, so we have to do that. We have to go through the numbers. Uh, might be of interest to you. And uh, be here at 645. It won't take long. All right. Also, I saw Sister Christine was handing out some of our tax receipts here. So if you get your receipt, look through it. If you think there's an error... Uh, see Sister Tressy Rye. <laughs> you know we are we are human. She's she's a she's the cutest secretary and, and accountant I've ever seen in my life. Amen. But she still is human. You'd have to live with her to know it, but she still is. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're happy to fix those things. All right. Uh, and I do want to thank everybody who came to Dave's uh, memorial service. Our prayers are with you and your family. I think it was a good memorial service, don't you think? Yeah. Thank all of you who brought food and came and participated. I know the family was touched by that. All right, we're gonna keep Colette in our prayers. Brother David Sheremy, remember him? Yeah. Well, he came down with some severe back pain today and they're asking us to keep him in prayer, so we'll do that tonight. Amen. And uh, any other prayer requests we can take before the Lord tonight? Sister Mary Lou? going to fill them with his spirit. We're hoping next, this coming weekend, to go up to Plattsburgh and work things out. 
Thank the Lord we bought a portable baptistry. We'll load that thing up and go. But thank you, Jesus. That's what it's all about. We're at the beginning of our prison ministry. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, brother. Amen. Lisa, the youngest son, in Jesus' name, we believe that. All right. Anybody else? Uh, there's still some. Uh, that the, 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 we can get a visa for his youngest son that can come. The youngest son is still 14 years old, still overseas in Pakistan. You know, they, they miss each other terribly, I'm sure. Amen. And then there are some sniffly noses and upset tummies still out there. See a few folks out tonight. We just bind and rebuke that flu spirit, upset stomach spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Any unspoken needs we can take before the Lord? Why don't we raise our hands to him right now and lift up the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we lift each and every one of these needs before you, Lord. We call these needs before you in the mighty precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you Continue to worship the Lord tonight with our worship team. Amen. Hallelujah. When I think.
His mercy and grace unfold, I hunger and thirst, I hunger and thirst, with arms stretched wide, I know you your heart's cry tonight. I completely surrender to you, Jesus. I give up every struggle. I give up every fight. I give up my right to be me. And I surrender to you. Lord, I no longer want to stand as an individual proclaiming the world of I. But this I surrenders. This I wants to be joined to you. This I does not want to stand as I. I want to be joined to the Spirit of the Lord. left, I want to be part of you and move left. When you move right, I want to move right. I don't want to go in my own direction. I don't want to make a step without
without consulting you. But your will is, Lord. Because I'm joined to you. Hallelujah. Part of your body. Not cut off. Not standing individual. This member of your body surrenders its individuality to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What an amazing, unifying, joining presence of God that is here tonight. Lord, you're knitting us together, stitching us together, making us fitly framed as this body grows up into the fullness of the stature of Christ. Lord, we want to lose our individual identity and just become you. So seamlessly joined to you that people don't see me. They don't see my imperfections. They don't see my faults. They don't see my failures. They don't see my fears doubts, my troubles. When people look at me, Lord, let them see you. I feel that hard cry here tonight. If that's your hard cry tonight, would you lift up your voice to the Lord and clap your hands to him right now and say, yes, Lord. Lord, I want to be joined to you tonight. Hallelujah. I worship you, Lord God. I worship you, Lord. He's calling you. He is welcoming you. He is drawing you into himself tonight. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Oh, we are his breath. We are his every care. We are his every desire. Nothing happens in your life that escapes his attention. Because you are his. You're his precious. You're the apple of his eye tonight. I feel someone has wondered lately. This last couple of weeks you've wondered, but I'm here to tell you that God does not lie. His word is true, and you're the apple of his eye tonight. Mm. Mm. Someone, would you receive that tonight? Mm. Hallelujah. The enemy is a liar. Let every man be a liar. But God, let God be true. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. While you're all standing tonight, why don't we go to the word of the Lord tonight? Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, I bless your name. Someone whisper, I love you, Jesus. Someone say it a little louder, I love you, Jesus. Someone say it to the top of your lungs, I love you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The power of the unified voice of his body. Hmm. Hallelujah. We're going to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. Mm. Speak to us, Lord. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, How can he love God who he has not seen? And this commandment, everybody say commandment. You mean we still have commandments to follow in the New Testament? Yeah, Yeah, we do. It's not a free for all. Go out there and do your own thing. Hallelujah, you're saved now. Go live any way that you want to. No, we're part of a body. And here's the commandment we have from him that 
He who loves God loves his brother also. Somebody say, I love my brother tonight. Amen. You may be seated if you promise to preach with me tonight. Lord, I seek your anointing tonight. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let the words that come forth from this mouth, let it be your words. Let every thought that runs across this mind, I surrender to you. And let my thoughts... My own distinct thoughts be put aside and and let me speak the thoughts of Almighty God tonight. Lord, you made a way, you made a vehicle for that to be possible. It's called your spirit. It's called your anointing. And Lord, I desperately cry out to you tonight. I seek your anointing upon this mouth. In this mind, this heart, in Jesus' name. Because, Lord, I want to treat your body right. I want to treat your bride right tonight. Because you love your bride. And you died for her. Hallelujah. We're continuing this series of being a community. And I think the Lord's given me one more part, if the Lord's willing. I'll talk about this one more time. But tonight, I want to talk to you tonight about being a team member. Did you know that every group of people that come together, they're sort of a community? Did you know that even Walmart shoppers, you're all in Walmart at the same time? You're you're a bit of a community, a type of community. In every community or grouping of human beings, there are certain rules. Certain unspoken rules, certain spoken rules. And if you don't think there is in Walmart, now sometimes I've wondered. I've seen some crazy stuff in Walmart. But there are some unspoken rules. Rules of conduct just for being in the building. Minimum expectations of conduct towards each other, fellow shoppers. <clears throat> See, without that, boy, you're talking about chaos. And God is not the author of chaos. He's not the author of confusion. God is a God of order. He likes order. Things go well, generally speaking, when there's order. If you're a customer, there's certain expectations. Get a cart. Go find what you're looking for. Mind your own business. If you expect one of the workers to go fill your list for you, you might be waiting a while. That's not part of the expectations of shopping at Walmart. And you're expected to be civil to fellow shoppers. You can't rob or steal or kidnap or stab fellow shoppers. You can't yell at them, make fun of them, cuss them out. Ran them with a cart. If you do such things, you just may be asked to leave. With a bit of authority from the law. And you can't be in there criticizing Walmart. Boasting and touting Target. Try that. See how long that lasts. Walk around. You know, you can get, you walk up to people, you can get this thing cheaper at Target. You know, you can get that cheaper at Amazon online. This one, this is not as good as that one. After a while, they're going to find you and say, you know, stop it. <laughs> Would you go shop somewhere else? Basic rules of conduct, expectations for being a member of that community. And probably the, one of the most important thing is you're expected to pay for what you get. They take that one real seriously. Just try breaking that little rule. You might have a problem. So you say, Pastor, what is the minimum, the very, very minimum expectation of attending you? And that's that you treat your fellow brother and sisters with love. 
and kindness, civility, mercy, and a lot of grace. Do you remember what grace is? Grace is undeserved failure. Oh, favor. <laughs> undeserved favor. The Lord gave us grace. He gave us favor. He smiled. He made a way for us to escape when we did not deserve it. And he expects us to be like him. And it's a great thing when I treat you with grace, when we treat each other with grace. Even though in my mind you may not expect my favor, you may not expect my civility, you may not expect common, basic human behavior from me, I'm going to give it to you. Because it's grace. And it's grace that saved us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You're called to this, folks. If you're here tonight, this is your vocation. It's your job. Please walk worthily of it. And this is it. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. We talked about this before, forbearing. What does forbearing mean? Just put up with them. That's it. Just put up with it. You know, on your last nerve, just put up with it. Because we're all children of God. And if you've ever been in a nursery before or if you've ever raised little ones before, kids do the crazy things to each other. Little siblings knocking each other over, putting things in another sibling's eye. Oh, honey, get your finger out your brother's eye. Honey, would you stop that? Would you get off that? Would you leave your brother alone? It's true. We're all brothers and sisters, and sometimes we handle each other a little rough. So would you please forgive me if I put my finger in your eye? Would you forgive your brother or sister if they accidentally poke you with the elbow? Even if they do it intentionally, what are you going to do? Show them grace. Talking about building in the community. With all loneliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And dropping down in the same chapter, down to 29 and 32. I love the fourth chapter. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So don't go talking smack. Don't complain and, and don't talk about people. Just only say that which is good to the use of edifying. So I am learning as time goes, before I speak a thought, I say, is that edifying? Is that building somebody up? Or is he going to tear somebody down? You know, there are two strategies to have the tallest building in town. You can work, you can endeavor, and build the highest structure in town. The other way is to tear everybody else's building down but yours. They both work, but one leaves utter destruction to a town. But we're here to edify the body of Christ. We're here to edify and build this church. Amen? Amen. Are we here for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All of you. Both of you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Now, and here's the main reason here. If we don't do that, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. But you know, it grieves the Holy Ghost. When we don't talk about each other the right way. Whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That is the New Testament way. That's the age of grace. 
Why should I forgive you if you did something to me? Because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. That's what Christians do. I a slide for you. So being a member here is being part of a body, is being a lively stone. How many of you know what this thing is here? Oh, yeah, somebody knows. It's a team of stones, a team of believers. More than a team, being a member is being part of that special living building. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2, 20 and 23. And you are built, somebody say built, built, upon the foundation of the apostles. Not every woman chase of doctrine and every televangelist. Church of the living God is not founded on self-gratification, self-improvement, self-glory. Happiness. Happy, happy. Sometimes being down there on the wall is, uh, it, just, it just is what it is. But we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows up into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. See, that's what we're doing. We're built to each other, stuck together, making this wonderful temple, this living body. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 9, is it all right we do a little teaching? To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, you also as lively stones are built in, up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Being a member here, being united. I can read you the scripture again in Ephesians 4, 1 through 5. Ephesians, Ephesians, it is, there's a lot of scripture about this. Paul talks a lot about this to the Ephesians. I'm quoting a lot from the Ephesians. He's talking to them a lot about functioning together as one body. I just wonder if we did a study of the history and the Greek Ephesian culture of the day. If it was a lot like modern American culture. Why are we obsessed with ourselves? We are, aren't we? I can prove it to you. Maybe that slide here. Burger King, right? Have it your way. You know, that started back in the 70s. It's been so successful. They still use that, don't they? Because it appeals to us, something within us. This American consumerism. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trashing America at all. Don't you get me wrong. I love America. I'm a patriot. This is still the best country on the planet. But it may not be perfect. And there are a few little things in us that are not conducive to building a unified body and kingdom of God. And so for us to do that, we need to identify the things that we come to the table with, the things that we are brought up, part of our culture that we take and we understand and we just live without even questioning, but that may not make it easy for us to fit in and line up to the kingdom of God. So please, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trashing American culture. I just want to identify a few things, and this is one of them. We have become spoiled consumers. How I many of you have heard the phrase, the customer is always right? Any business that doesn't have that as their slogan, motto, and means of operating don't usually last long. Because American consumers have come to expect such behavior from businesses. We expect to have it our way. 
Unfortunately, most Americans think that church is the same thing, that it's about the same thing. It's the same way. The same rules apply. The same mindset apply. They have kind of become spoiled to the idea of thinking that the whole point of a church is to be served well. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about this church, thank God. I don't think any of you came here to be served, right? I think you all came to serve. That's what church is about. It's about serving. I'm here to serve you. You're here to serve me. We serve each other. We serve the kingdom of God. We're not here to see how much we can get out of it. You know, American consumerism, we want the most for the littlest cost. The greatest benefit for the littlest cost, which is a problem. So you can see why churches sometimes today that are growing and flourishing in huge, huge numbers here, they are selling you the myth that you can have your religious experience and it won't cost you much. You can continue to appease your flesh and live like the devil and still get your little time clock clicked in. Get your credit. Get your little time card. So when you hop up to heaven and you say, see, I spent a lot of time in church. Let me in. Is that all right? The people that need to hear this are not here, are they? <laughs> preaching to the choir. Somebody say, preaching to the choir, Pastor. All right. If you don't like that church, I don't like that church. People didn't honor and respect me and treat me well. They didn't realize how special I am. So what do you do if you're a consumer and you're tired of your store? Why well, you just go check out another one? And you become an eternal church butterfly until you find a place that serves you. Is that why God exists? To serve you? No. Well, church exists to make me feel good. So preacher, if you don't make me feel good, I just might not come back. I've known people. Again, not you. The music didn't entertain me. I didn't feel comfortable there. Really? Is it what it's about? Is it about our comfort? Thank God for the heat. All right, I'm okay with that. Air conditioning and the heat. But is it about our comfort? Did Jesus die, shed his blood for our comfort? <laughs> My. My, my. All right. So let's ask the world about the church. Hey, religious world of 2018, what is the church all about? <laughs> and we swallow it. We believe it. And so American culture... Not just American culture, other cultures are not teasing just American culture. We struggle with that one little thing. We kind of get the idea that it's all about us. It's all about me. Individuality. It's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a problem in the church of the living God because we have to become unified. We have to lose our individual identities and become him. Something bred into all of us, we have to recognize and submit to God if we're going to be used by God. How many of you want to be used by God? Did you know you cannot be used by God if you plant your flag and insist on being the individual that you are? You can't. There's something that has to die before life comes forth, the true source of life. Listen, you know, I, I'm not trying to contradict myself. I'm a very independent person, and I pride myself on being self-reliant. People think they come to our house, they're like, oh, you're off the grid. You're one of those going to be self-dependent. Self no, not completely that much. But I do not believe in depending on anybody else. I don't believe in depending on the government, for example for my sustenance because 
who I depend on, I look to as my provider. And I have to learn and recognize to depend on him and not on them. So that makes me a little bit of an individualist. He says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Ever heard the phrase rugged individualism? Rock. Yeah, that's show me that little slide. Rugged. I wish I could just push the buttons up here, just push the pictures I want. We'll do that, right? We'll... Yeah, right. This this man embodies rugged individualism, right? You see that we like that. Because we're Americans. We like that. You got to be a survivor. We foster that. We encourage that. I'm a pioneer. You know, some of us, we relish the opportunity to overcome a few obstacles in our lives. How many of you just like a good struggle, like a good fight? Hmm? Be honest. Right? It's true. Don't you like overcoming, beating something, hardships? Listen, I'm a Cajun. And when there's a Cajun, there's a way. I'm from South Louisiana where it rarely snows. Easy winters down there. Life is easy and life is cheap. But I chose to live in the Northeast. Part of it is because I like to survive in tough odds. I know something about me. I like to be out there driving in the crazy weather. I, I don't know why. I like to be out there shoveling on it. Now by March, I'm done. Don't get me wrong. I've had enough. You can pack it up, send it on. We'll see you again in, you know, seven, eight, nine months. But I kind of like that. I like surviving where I'm not supposed to survive. <laughs> Is that a slide I got? So I moved here to the Northeast. And winter sometimes is a little bit of a a hardship. And this Cajun moves to the state of New York. The Adirondacks, for goodness sake. What's wrong with me? And when the Lord asked me to start and pastor a oneness, holiness, Pentecostal church here in the cold Northeast, You got to love challenges. <laughs> you got to love challenges. And I do. You got to love facing the impossible to do all that. But the Lord has shown me to lean on him. You just can't do this if you're a sissy. And I'm not a sissy. Because I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things. You can live for God. One night, some of you were here. This lady came up here. Bless her heart. And I really do pray that she finds deliverance one day. But the spirit that had been running her life came in here and stood up and was saying how hard it was to live for God. Impossible and terrible it was to live for God. And I'm like, I do not agree. We talked about the power of agreement. I do not agree with that. See, the enemy would like you to think that. But we are more than overcomers. Right? That world may throw obstacles our way, and there is an enemy trying to oppose us. But I can do all things through Christ. Now, if I try to live for God on my own, then I'm just obeying a bunch of rules and I'm powerless and I'm not really depending on him. I'm not doing it through him. But we can do anything the Lord calls us to do, especially through Christ who strengthens us. And what is your strength? Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you find yourself, this is something, this this is for free for new folks. If you find yourself struggling one day and you're like, oh, this is for God's stuff, what you need to do is find yourself some joy fast. 
Hallelujah. Sister Olivia, turn on some music and you just start praising and worshiping the Lord and you find some joy. And before you know it, you're like one minute, you're about to give up and throw it. And it's like, well, it's not you. Uh, and they next thing you know, you're crying in his presence and you are renewed and in strength. It's the joy of the Lord. Amen. Whenever the, whenever the enemy is facing you and challenging you with the impossible circumstances, when you lose a loved one, you need a little strength. So you have to find your joy in the Lord. Put on some good Christian music and find some joy. And that's your strength. Just reach out and just start crying out to him and do not stop until you touch him. I don't care how long it takes. See, I know you want to go shopping, but I got to go lock myself in my prayer closet for a while. I'll come out when I'm ready, but right now I got to go touch God. Because I need a little strength in my life. If you do these simple things, the other thing is to live for God with everything you have. And it's very easy. If you try to live for God with one toe in, that's very difficult. If you live for God easy, it's hard. But if you live for God hard, it is easy. Throw everything you have into it. Hallelujah. Mm-mm-mm. I'm not going to lie. You can't be a sissy. You can't be a give up. It takes a real man, takes a real woman to live for God. It does. But I can do all things through Christ. Now, as much as I enjoy this individualism, self-rugged survivorship in me, I have to check in my do-it-myself attitude when I walk in the door. Because there's one thing I cannot do on my own. It's make it to heaven. And even though I'm saved, repent in my sins, baptized in his name, full of his spirit, I still can't make it without you. I got to be in the boat. I got to be part of a body. Well, I can just worship at home. It's all fine. I can have church. No, no, you keep believing that stuff, and it won't take long. You're not getting the blood flowing through you. Get that tourniquet off. If you let that devil slip that tourniquet around you, suffocate you, get that thing off. You got to get some blood flowing. You've got to feel the heartbeat of God. You've got to find out what the heartbeat of the Holy Ghost is wanting to do. Tune into that and open up. Don't clamp yourself down. Open yourself up to receive from him. Individuals have a tough time making it to heaven. You can be an individual survivor out on the job. But when you come in here, you got to be part of a body. You've got to surrender your individualism. Surrender your own identity so you can take on the identity of Christ. Is this making sense? Am I preaching to somebody else tonight, not just me? Hallelujah. So let me talk once again for uh, all the new folks we have. Community identity uh, is greatly developed in fellowship. It's... uh, it's kind of easy to spot those that understand this. You know, before 1986, when I did go to church in that, that prior religious system that I grew up in, um, we would get there late or get there just in time, and uh, we would be out the door as soon as that priest did his thing. We were done. And we thought he was a fanatic and holding us against our will if it took an hour and five minutes. But you see, I wasn't part of a community. I was showing up to get the credit on my clock, do my religious duty, and getting the heck out of there so I could get back to what? My life. Pick up and assume my identity. Really didn't understand or comprehend the concept of being part of a group, being part of a body, being part of a church family. So in, in 1986, when, when, I, when I was saved, um, I noticed that nobody wanted to go home. And it's good. It's good. Because that time of fellowship that we spend with each other afterwards, we're forging community. We're exchanging community. 
And that's how community grows. Is that all right? And we're going to talk about some other things too next time, about other practical things that we can do as individuals to foster a community here. But it was so great finally being part of a family, a great big family. You know, one of the things, I always felt I got the short end of the stick because I didn't have a brother. I had a sister. There was only two kids in the family. And she was 10 months younger than me, and she was mean. <laughs> she beat me up. I was older than her, but she beat me up. <laughs> we get along great now. She lives just 10 minutes away from me in Stony Creek. But I always wondered what it would be like to have a brother. Because I'd see people, my cousins, they had brothers. They were playing football in the yard. And all. You know, wasn't that cool? And then when, when I got in the church... I felt the Lord kind of speak to me. I didn't understand what was happening to me there, but I looked around, and I saw all those people standing around concerned about me and praying for me. And so all the fear I had before kind of melted away, and I understood, wow. And then I realized I just inherited, like, dozens of brothers and sisters. I'm finally going to get my brother. My brother from another mother, but it's my brother. So all of you men in here tonight, would you stand up one time for me? Stand up. Stand up. All right, praise God. If you can, amen. I want to thank you for being my brother. Amen. You're the answer to a little boy's prayer. Thank you for being a brother, being there for me. And you're not just my brother. You're brothers to each other. It's a great big family. And I'm glad I got so many sisters because y'all are nice. My sister's so sweet now. <laughs> it's all about being part of a family. Hallelujah. Now, here's the catchy part. Sometimes being a team member requires... I didn't ask Sister Tressie to sing that song, but it was perfect. Sometimes being a team member requires surrendering what's best for us individually for the team. Yeah? Maybe it is something as simple as letting a brother or sister, letting them get a pat on the back when you know you're the one that deserved it. Maybe it's as simple as letting them get the glory when you know that really you're responsible for that. Maybe it's about edifying and building someone else up even though you could have done the job better yourself. And letting them try, letting them do it. Have you ever seen a parent sometimes do like these projects for the kids at school? And that parent does 90% of the project, right? They do it. Well, Johnny, you got to do something here. Here, sign right here. <laughs> and they've done everything else. Well, then they go to school and they present their project and it's like, wow, that's an amazing project. Well, that parent sits back there and says, hmm? so proud of what little Johnny did, right? So why is that? Most parents wouldn't step up there and say, I did it. No, they want their child to get the credit. Why? Because the family gets the glory when the child shines. And so the Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself, took on the form of a man, made a little lower than angels, so that you and I, his children would get the glory. The Bible says that he became poverty so that you could live and enjoy in his riches. The Bible says that he became this ugly old sin so that you could enjoy the glorious eternity of eternal life. Because Jesus is not about himself. 
He's about you. He's about his bride. He's about how can I sacrifice myself that somebody else benefits. That's Christ-like. That's Christ-like. And this rare shortage even in the ministry today, in the modern church. In the modern church, I've seen people choose ministry, choose preaching as a career option. Well, I think I like that one because I want a lot of people to look up to me and talk to me and put money in the basket and to make me feel good about myself. Some people think that's what it's about, but it's not. That's why Jesus says, let me get some things straight among you that would dare to call yourselves teachers and leaders of my people. Let the ministers be the servants. Let the first be last, the last be first. If you don't know how to humble yourself, you have no, no right stepping up. Walking in humility, letting someone else get the glory. Mm. Mm. Romans chapter 10, verse... Chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Did you know, and as our church grows, this will become more and more, uh, not, not an issue, this will be, become more uh, a possibility, a privilege, is that there, there are going to be, I'm prophesying to you, there are going to be business people rising up and being in this church. And you are going to do business with your brother and your sister even though it may cost you more and maybe you could get it done somewhere else because you're going to prefer your brother and your sister because that's community. And sometimes you're going to get burnt. But what you're going to do, you're going to forbear each other, forgive each other. <laughs> Woo! Because we're all part of a body. Mm. We're all working for the bigger picture than ourselves. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what? This church is growing. We're growing in power. We're growing in number. And we're growing in authority. And we're growing in miracles. And we're growing in influence. But the wonderful thing is we are all sharing in that together. In other words, when this church looks good, you look good. When we make Jesus look good, he makes us look good. And when I make you look good, the church looks good. Amen. So when the church physically looks good, we make Jesus look good. So I thank all of you who sacrifice your time cleaning this place. Without recognition, choosing rather to be behind the scenes because you understand this principle that it is something greater than you. And when the church looks good, it comes back on you. The Lord looks good. But Ron, when the sound goes off wonderfully, everything is fine and fantastic, you're not making yourself look good. You're doing this for the glory and the benefit of this church. Brother Randy, I wish you were here tonight. The one, all the, the hours she spent here painting. do these walls look great? Why did he do that? To beautify the church. Not to beautify himself. I don't think he looked good in his color anyway. <laughs> Brother John, when you tackle those sidewalks out there, you're an individual doing that for the body. When those sidewalks look good and they're safe, you make the church look good. And Jesus looks good. And you're a part of this church. I don't want to start with individuals. I don't mean to miss anybody. Everyone who's ever cleaned, everyone who's given, everyone who's ever served, preparing food, bringing things together for those in need, everyone who's ever taught, 
And I just want to say that I'm so glad that I am a part of this church. Because you look good. You make Jesus look good. And I share in that glory. And a successful team member is always interested in building the team and not the self. Ephesians 4.16. I want to read that to you in the King James Verse and then we'll do it in the NLT. Ephesians 4.16. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Here we go again. Edifying, building itself. The body builds itself. That's what your job is. Pastor, what am I supposed to be doing here? Well, first of all, you're supposed to be edifying each other. All right, now I want to read this to you again in NLT, a little bit more modern English, verse 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be like children forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made uh, made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Here it is. Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does its own special work. Do you know each and every one of you have your own special work? Some of them more visible. Some of them are less visible. But there's no difference in the importance. It helps the other parts grow. When you do your part and you're contributing, you are helping your brother and your sister grow. Grow in Christ. So that the whole body is healthy. Everybody say, we have a healthy church. And growing and full of love. I thank you, Jesus. You should give yourselves a hand clap. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So being a member here is being part of a team, being a team player and being united. Can you imagine in the realm of sports, how long would an NFL quarterback be employed if he kept throwing passes to the opponent's members? Not very long. I don't follow football all the time, but I do know that last weekend the Patriots won against the Titans. Anybody knew that? So, would they have won the game if the Patriot team members kept tackling other Patriots? Wouldn't that be crazy if the Patriot receivers would catch the ball from, what's his name? Tom Brady. Only to turn around and give it to a Titan? Craziness. Confusion. But you know what? I have known some Christians who think the way to build a church is to toss the ball to the devil. And here's how we do it. Every time you raise your tongue in criticism or even raise your eyebrow. At a fellow team member. Sarcasm. Defamation. Against a fellow church member. You are tackling your own team member. What need of the devil is there then? He could just go home. He doesn't doesn't have a job. Wouldn't be covering your brother or sister. But did you know that every time you pray for your brother and your sister, you cover them? Ever seen those guys block tackles from the opposing team members? Every time you pray for your poor pastor up here, you're protecting him from the blitz. That's right. I rebuke that, Jesus. (laughs) Somebody's got to throw that word out there, right? And every time you cover your brother and your sister in prayer, you're blocking them from being tackled by the enemy. Every time you edify, you compliment your brother or your sister, you're edifying them. You're building them up. You're strengthening them. And this is even more so important when you speak kindly of one another behind their back. Some of I go to Sister Emily and I say how great and wonderful Mary Lou is. 
instead of raising my eyebrow and making all kind of comments and cockeyed things. And now we're on the same team here. I'm so glad we don't have that problem here. Thank you, Jesus. So the truth is, either we're going to work together as a team and remember who the real enemy is, or we'll drop the ball. Because the old saying is true, united we stand, and divided we will fall. So either we work together and enjoy the spoils of victory together, or we should just forfeit the game. Why risk going out there and being injured? If we're just going to forfeit and give it over to him, just hand the victory to the devil? Then it's safer? I actually know people who decided to quit living for God, quit coming to church, because things got rough once he started getting closer to God. So what should we do? Should we say, well, they're such a loser. I could tell their heart really wasn't in it. They really didn't have a heart for God. I knew they weren't going to make it. Should we say that? Should we speak curses upon them that way? Or should we say, I know that so-and-so is not here, and I haven't seen them in a while. I'm getting to my knees. I'm going to cover them. It could be that the enemy is trying to blitz them. It could be the enemy is trying to take them out and take them down. Maybe just maybe an encouraging reach out and talk to them. Hey, we notice you're missing. Some people feel that one of the number one reasons people quit coming to church is they didn't feel like they were part. And so when somebody quits coming and the phone doesn't even ring, the devil was near his seat. They didn't even notice you weren't there. You didn't belong there. You weren't part of that. So just say, hey, hey, we miss you. What's going on? Is there anything I can do for you? Anything I can do to pray for you, encourage you? Think about that. Amen. Because you never know who's being attacked. I had a slide for you, a slide for the huddle. I wonder if Sister Tressie could come. Somebody could grab Sister Tressie. Huddle. Hallelujah. There it is. What's that called? The huddle. I think sometimes it's valuable for us to all get into the huddle. And to listen to what our leader is saying the plan is. What's the game plan? Get the plan from the coach. And the plan today will be for us to cover each other. Love each other. Go to bat for each other. Prefer each other. To bear each other's burdens. And to block the tackles of the enemy. So what are the trophies? What are the spoils of victory in this game, in this battle that we're playing against the devil? Is it a great big Vince Lombardi gold trophy thing? Is that what we're fighting for? Is that what we're playing for? The devil's playing for keeps. He don't want to give any of those marbles back. No, what we are fighting for are those precious lost souls. And you and I are working together to advance the gospel line of scrimmage one play at a time, one Sunday at a time. And everybody here has a part. Everybody has a role. There are no big me's and little you's here. Everybody's needed. Everybody needs to do their job. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have the proper name and label hanging over the door of your church. No. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. I'm so proud of this church. 
It's a very loving, tender, and giving church. When needs arise, you guys just stand up and jump forward almost overwhelmingly. So sometimes we have to like throttle it down just in little pieces. Because I know if we tell everybody everything at once, that's great. That's a wonderful thing. Because you do not know what you're doing. You're showing love, love for one another. And this is the kind of thing that this world uses to measure whether or not we are a legitimate church. It's if we have love one to another. So when there's a member of the church in need and we stand up to meet that need together, others are watching, others are looking, and it brings tears to their eyes. And they say, my God, that's what church is about. Those people are really Jesus' disciples. They're really his followers. They must be the real deal. I want to be part of that. Didn't you feel that? I certainly felt that. When I first came through those doors in 1986, so many years ago. Church before, nobody cared if I was there or not. But then I became part of a family. The first time I didn't show up because I had a sore throat. People were like, where's Brother Spencer? Where is he? Is he okay? I love that. I just love being part of a body. And finally, we are called to bear each other's burdens. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Pray for one another. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Your efforts and your labor are more efficient when you work with your brother and sister. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls. For he has not another to help him up. And again, if two lie together, then they can conserve. They can have, hot, they can have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. Somebody comes beating up on your brother and sister. If you got two brothers, they can withstand an attack. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So you see the trick the enemy plays on people? Oh, I can be saved by myself. I can stay. I can read my Bible at home and I'm going to be fine. I don't need to be in that building full of hypocrites. Have you heard that? Well, that's exactly what the devil wants. Because you are a little itty bitty strand by yourself. But woven together a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Hey, nobody's breaking this church. We're woven and we're bound together. The devil can pull, the devil can tug, and he can pull and he can tug. He can do all he can, but you and I bound together are not quickly broken. And the very gates of hell cannot stand against this church because you and I are woven together. In Jesus' name. Amen. One more slide for you. Working together, bearing a burden together. Let's seek opportunities to serve each other. If you see a need, offer to fill it. Offer to meet that need. How about it tonight? I wonder if we could all stand. And let's all come forward. I don't know if many of you have heard this little catchy saying before, but it really describes the meaning of Christian behavior. It's very, very simple. It's an acronym. It's the word joy, J-O-Y. It's Jesus, others, then ourselves. 
And you realize if you have that approach, you put yourself last and you put everybody else first, putting the Lord first, you don't need to cover yourself. You don't need to protect yourself because every one of your brothers and sisters has got your back. Jesus, others, and then you. It's pretty cool. And the Lord said it this way in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 and 40. This is right out of the scripture. Master, which is the great commandment, the most important one in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. And I think you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second one is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus, others, self. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What Jesus meant was it wouldn't even be a need for a Bible if everybody would just, God, others, self. Every other scripture, every other mandate, every commandment would be fulfilled. wonder if we could just pray for each other. Or if maybe just take the hand of the person next to you right now. All bind together, one mind and one accord. And let's do what he says in James. Let's pray for each other. You pray for this church. Pray for your brothers. I wonder if you could look down to the left and call each and every one of the brothers that you see before the Lord left and right hallelujah that the Lord would bless them and meet their needs the Lord would take care of them that the Lord would grant them mercy and favor the Lord would grant abundant blessing upon them that the Lord would calm their hearts soothe their souls that every trouble and every problem would just vanish away under the mighty pressure and the weighty glory of the name of Jesus Christ here tonight Thank you, Lord God, that the blood of Jesus Christ is moving and is flowing through his body here tonight. I thank you, Jesus, that you are working, that you're developing, and you're growing in community, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you have laid it upon my heart, this pastor's heart, to preach and to teach community, Lord, because you are preparing us. You are preparing us to become the foundation for the growth You're preparing us, Lord God, to work together as a family, to be a firm foundation to support all the new new believers that are coming in. Hallelujah. Mm. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given us such a beautiful, wonderful church. Many individuals who have put their individual needs aside. And they're working, Lord, for your body. Seeking your kingdom first and seeking your body. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I really am proud of this church. I really am so proud and honored to know each and every one of you. I'm looking across each and every face, and I know your hearts. I've seen it. And you have hearts for the Lord, and you have hearts and love for each other. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I wonder if we could just clap our hands one more time in the worship and the praise of him, Lord. Why don't you thank the Lord for your brother next to you? Why don't you thank the Lord for your sister next to you right now? Hallelujah. I thank you for my brothers. I thank you for my sisters, Lord God. I thank you for opening my eyes that I might see needs or where I can step in and fill in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I thank you for the strength, Lord God, and the unity that I feel here tonight. Hallelujah.
Glory to your wonderful name, Lord. Glory to your wonderful name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel such strength right here tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When we worship the Lord Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 All right. He's as good as here. Amen. Speaking of being here, Brother Reginald, we're so glad you're here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're going back, and then you're coming back up, right? All right. Safe travels to you. 
we'll find a warm place for you. Amen. <laughs> all right. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. We'll see you guys Wednesday night. Amen. Thank you, Lord.